The purpose of this lecture is to introduce you to the angiosperms, the flowering plants, and also I'm going to emphasize the anatomy of their flowers. I wanted to start by examining this diagram that we looked at when I introduced the bryophytes, the lycophytes, the manilophytes, and also the gymnosperms. So you can see that the flowering plants or the angiosperms are a closely related are closely related to the gymnosperms. They are another group of seed plants or spermatophytes. The angiosperms are a relatively recently evolved group of plants. So they evolved um, about 125 million years ago and began to dominate about 100 million years ago. So before that, the earth was dominated by um, gymnosperms like the cycads um, until the angiosperms evolved and they became really common on our planet and they still are today. They are not just abundant, this group is also very species rich. So there are over 250,000 species of angiosperms, making them one of the most diverse phyla of organisms on the planet, and certainly the most diverse group of plants. They are diverse also in terms of their form. So this phylum, the flowering plants, includes herbaceous plants like grasses. It includes flowering woody plants, so trees such as maples and basswoods. It includes vining plants. It also includes some aquatic plants like water lilies, and it includes plants that are highly adapted to survive in dry environments such as cacti. Most angiosperms are autotrophs, so they're making a living by making their own food through photosynthesis. And that's a common trait to all plants. Um, so generally all plants are autotrophs. However, there are a few angiosperms that are parasitic, so they're non-photosynthetic, so like this daughter plant that you see here um, growing on top of these other flowering plants. It's an example of a parasitic flowering plant. It taps into the food that its hosts have made, its host plants, the one that it's growing on, and that's where it gets its energy. There are also some carnivorous plants, we've talked about that before, including our local Darlingtonia californica, the California pitcher plant. This plant makes a living by making sugars through photosynthesis, so it is autotrophic, but it supplements its, it supplements its nutrients by digesting the bodies of insects and other invertebrates. So this is a relatively recent group of plants, and it's extremely diverse, not only in species, but also in form and ecology. Okay, so now I want to examine the traits that make the angiosperms special, or their shared derived traits. So these are traits that the all angiosperms have in common, and their traits that none of the other plants that we've examined have. So that includes the bryophytes, the gymnosperms, the seedless vascular plants, and the lycophytes. So the shared derived traits of the angiosperms are their flowers and their fruit. So no other plants generate flowers and no other plants generate fruits. Flowers are specialized shoots for sexual reproduction. So here we can see the flowers of rhododendron. The flower contains the structures that are going to generate the gametes. It 
they're going to generate the sperm cells and they're going to generate the egg cells, sometimes on the same flower, sometimes on different flowers, depending on the species. These are highly specialized structures. Some of them, like the rhododendron, are really flashy in color and they are attractive to animals and they allow um, the angiosperms to attract animal pollinators. So that helps to ensure that their sperm cells are going to be dispersed to the egg of another plant and that sexual reproduction will happen. So that's a huge advantage over, for example, the gymnosperms, which also generated pollen, but it was almost always just gonna be distributed by the wind, a much less precise means of dispersal. The angiosperms also make fruits. So the fruit is the tissue that develops around the seed. So we're familiar with a lot of the fruits that we find in the grocery store, like the kiwi fruit. Um, fruits are useful to the angiosperms. Sometimes they help to disperse the seed. So think about the dandelion. So the fruit of the dandelion includes those little structures that are um, kind of fuzzy and they allow that seed to get carried by the wind so that they can dis so that they can be dispersed far from the mother plant. Some fruits protect the seed. For example, think about a peach. So what we call the pit, if you crack that open, that's actually the seed inside. It looks kind of like an almond. So that's an example where that hard part that surrounds the seed is part of the fruit, and that's there to protect that seed so that that fruit can be eaten by an animal, and then it can be dispersed by that animal, but that animal is not going to harm the seed, so it's going to be able to go through that animal's digestive tract and germinate. It's not going to get chewed up. So these are the shared drive traits of the angiosperms, and they are a, a major part of their success. Flowers and fruits have been extremely useful adaptations. Next, I want to show you some of the parts of the flower. So we'll start from the bottom. So down here, we have this little stalk or pedicel. And then we have the receptacle. So the receptacle is the part of this stalk that the other floral parts are attached to. And botanists talk about the flower in terms of whorls. And whorls are these layers. So you have your bottom layer down here, and then you've got this layer that's in red and then this third layer up here in yellow, and then the blue layer um, located farther up on the receptacle. Um, and so that's what we refer to as whorls and these layers of insertion. These whorls are inserted one on top of the other. So these whorls are either sterile or fertile, and the two sterile whorls are the ones that don't make any gametes. So that's this whorl down here at the bottom and this next whorl up here that's in red, whereas these other two are going to produce the gametes eventually, and so those two are referred to as the fertile whorls. Okay, so the sterile whorls include the sepals. So the sepals are these structures that are inserted at the bottom of the flower. They often protect the flower um, when it's in bud. Sometimes they can be highly attractive, like in poinsettia. So what you probably think of as those big red petals in poinsettia, those are actually sepals, and the petals are quite small. So they have a number of roles. They are not fertile, so they don't generate the reproductive parts. And the calyx is the term that describes this whole world, whereas the sepal would describe these individual, um, these individual parts. The next 
sterile whorl is the corolla, which is made up of the petal of the flowers. And often the role of the petals is to attract animal pollinators. Next, we start to get into the fertile parts of the flower. So moving up one layer, we have what's called the andresium. That's the male part of the flower. So the andresium is made up of stamens. And the stamens are made up of the anthers, which are at the top up here, and then the filament, which is kind of like the stalk that supports the anthers. The anther contains the pollen sacs. So if you were to take a cross section through the anther, you would see that it contains four microsporangia that generate the pollen. Now let's take a look at the female part of the flower, the gynecium. So the gynecium is made up of one or more carpels. And carpels include the style, which is this canal, the stigma, which is this little forked part, it's not always forked, um, right up at the top, that's the part that receives the pollen, and then the pollen is going to travel down through the style to the ovary, which is down here. And here we can see there's multiple ovules inside this ovary. I put a question mark here after the term pistil. So the Pacific States Wildflower Book talks about um, the, this, this part of the plant as a pistil. Um, there's a lot of confusion between the term carpal and the term pistil. Um, so I just want you to be aware that those may, some authors use these terms interchangeably, um, some don't. A flower can have more than one carpal, and sometimes if you cut open one of these carpels or pistils, you see that it's got multiple chambers or multiple carpels inside. So this is the female part of the plant where the ovules are located. Okay, I want to introduce you to a couple more terms about flowers. We refer to a flower that has all those whorls that we just looked at as complete. So if it has the calyx, corolla, the andresium, and the gynesium, we refer to it as complete. Whereas incomplete flowers are flowers that are lacking one or more whorls, like this willow flower down here. Pretty much all I can see in this flower are the anthers. It's possible there are really reduced um, other structures, but um, this is an example of a plant that is imperfect. So it lacks a sexual whorl, so that's why we're only seeing anthers here. So a flower that is imperfect is certainly not going to be complete. So this would also be an incomplete flower. It is both incomplete and imperfect. Whereas perfect flowers, like the rhododendron, are flowers that have both sexes present. So um, flowers that have both the andresium and the gynesium would be referred to as perfect. They might be incomplete, they could be lacking calyx, or they could be lacking a corolla, but if they have both sexes present, they would be referred to as perfect. Imperfect flowers can be on the same or on different plants. So um, if the imperfect flowers, so they could be carpelate, just made up of carpels, or staminate, just having stamens, if those carpelate and staminate flowers are on the same plant, we would call that species monoecious. If that species only generates uh, plants that either have staminate or carpelate flowers, it would be dioecious, so two different houses for the two different kinds of flowers. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention is that parts 
within a whirl may be fused or free. So if we take a look at this rhododendron flower, you can see that the petals are fused together. So they're stuck together forming sort of this cone-shaped corolla. One other important characteristic of a flower for identification purposes is the level of insertion of the ovary. This is a picture of an onion flower, and it is an example of a superior ovary. A superior ovary is one where the sepals, petals, and stamens are attached below the ovary. So this all of the point of attachment for all of these structures is below this green ovary. And in this diagram, this is a picture of a superior ovary. A semi-inferior ovary is one in which the sepals, petals, and stamens are attached at the side of the ovary. So that's what we see here in flower number two. So that would be a semi-inferior ovary. And then an inferior ovary is one in which the sepals, petals, and stamens are attached near the top of the ovary. So this is often another um, break in the key, an important break in the key when you're trying to key out wildflowers. What is the level of insertion of the ovary? This can be difficult to see, which is why it's often nice to bring a hand lens out into the field when you're trying to identify plants that are in flower. One more characteristic of flowers that can be important for identification purposes is the kind of symmetry in the flower. So the, the buttercup on the top photo is an example of a flower that has radial symmetry. So that means there's more than one plane of symmetry or sameness in the flower head. So we could draw a line through this part of the flower and we would have symmetry on both sides or we could draw it here. So that's an example of radial symmetry. Whereas this monkey flower, there's only one plane of symmetry and that's right down the center of this flower, a vertical line right through the center. So that's bilateral symmetry when there's only one plane of symmetry. So this is often um, another key characteristic that you need to examine when you're identifying wildflowers. One other floral trait that I wanted to mention is the idea that sometimes flowers are aggregated or clustered in an inflorescence, where an inflorescence is an aggregation of flowers or a cluster of flowers, and there's often some associated structures, things like bracts or pedicels. So here we have a diagram that's showing us a variety of inflorescences. Number one is called a raceme. So that's where you have this inflorescence and you've got the individual flowers coming branching off of a central stalk. Number two is an example of a spike and that's like the flowers of grasses. And it's kind of like a raceme, except that the flowers are tightly oppressed to that central stalk. Number three is an inflorescence called a panicle. And here you see that the um, flowers are coming off of these side branches. So they're branching off these side branches. Number four is a corum. Number five is an umbel. That's what we see in um, many plants that are in the carrot family. So the, all the flowers are coming off of this central, uh, the central spot down here, and they're all roughly the same distance above that point. In the composite family, we have plants 
where the inflorescence is a big flowering head like a sunflower. So that's actually made up of that huge, um, what we call a flower is actually an inflorescence, and it's made up of tiny little flowers. And then the last type of inflorescence that we have here is a catkin, and that's what we see in birches and alders. Okay, so next I want to change gears from looking at floral anatomy to trying to figure out how this reproductive structure, the flower, and the reproductive structures that are produced in the flower fit into the angiosperm life cycle. First, I want to be clear that the angiosperm life cycle is alternation of generations, just like we saw in all of the other plants. Um, it's dominated by the sporophyte generation, so the largest part of the generation is the sporophyte generation. We'll see that the gametophytes are extremely reduced in their size. They're really small. So we're already familiar with the structure of the flower. We know that the andresium produces stamens, and within the anther, the pollen grains are produced. So this is a little cutout of the anther, so we can peer into the microsporangium, and we can see that meiosis is generating pollen grains. So here's a pollen grain. Inside, this nucleus is going to divide and generate the male gametophyte. So it remains inside the spore wall. So the sporophyte made this spore, and then it divided inside the spore wall to generate the male gametophyte, the microgametophyte. The microgametophyte is going to give rise to the gametes, the sperm, and eventually the sperm are going to fuse with an egg forming the embryo that we see here in the seed. But let's take a look at how the egg is produced. So to see that, we're going to have to peer into the ovary of the plant. So within the carpal, we see this ovary, which contains multiple ovules. Here we see a larger image of the ovule. Meiosis is going to generate spores. One of those is going to survive, and it's going to generate the female gametophyte, or the megagametophyte, which is also called the embryo sac. The embryo sac includes the egg and a couple of other cells, including these two cells that just kind of hang out in the middle. The sperm, when pollination occurs, the pollen is going to land on the stigma, and it's going, and it's going to grow, this little tube is going to grow through the style all the way down into the ovule. So that's what we see here. The pollen tube grows all the way into the ovule and it ejects the sperm into the embryo sac. Each of those sperm is going to fertilize a component of the embryo sac. So this is called double fertilization and this is unique to the angiosperms. There's actually a couple of gymnosperms that do it, but all angiosperms have double fertilization. One of those sperm is going to fertilize the egg, forming the embryo. The other sperm is going to fertilize these nuclei, these two nuclei that are inside the embryo sac, forming a triploid endosperm, which is a nutritive tissue that helps to nourish this embryo as it grows. So we've got our young diploid sporophyte that resulted from fertilization inside the seed. The outer part of the ovule is going to form the seed coat. We know the endosperm forms from double fertilization. That seed is going to germinate, forming another flower, and the life cycle will begin again. So I want to mention one thing. This life cycle makes... Um, is illustrating self-pollination, right, or self-fertilization because the pollen and the egg are coming from the same individual. 
Many angiosperms have some kind of way to try to eliminate self-fertilization, whether it's, you know, the pollen being, being produced at a separate time from the stigma being receptive to pollen so that it can't fertilize itself, or um, in some cases the position of the um, anthers are such that the plant can reduce self-fertilization. So I wanted to point out that that's what's being um, show, illustrated in this diagram, but that's not ideal. So ideally, sexual reproduction is a way to enhance the genetic diversity of the species, and that's going to be enhanced if um, cross-pollination is happening between different individuals. Okay, so a little more about pollination. Like we just saw, this is a really important role in the angiosperm life cycle when the pollen is deposited or lands on the stigma of another plant of the same species. So one of the reasons why angiosperms are such a successful group of plants is that they have enlisted other animals to ensure that their pollen makes it to the stigma of another flower of the same species. So animal pollinators include insects and mammals and birds, and this is a very efficient means of getting pollen from one individual within the species to another one. So a bee, like the one in this picture, is going to be attracted to these pink cosmos. It may visit one, get pollen all over its legs, and then visit another flower, um, distributing that pollen onto the stigma of that other plant. So this is way more efficient than wind pollination, where the plant is just producing tons of pollen and hoping that the wind is going to carry it to a stigma somewhere out there in the world. This is much more targeted and much more efficient. And it has had a huge impact on both the evolution of flowers and the evolution of animal pollinators. So flowers have evolved to generate sweet nectar in order to entice animal pollinators to come and visit them. They've evolved really showy petals in order to attract animal pollinators. Some of them have a really specific shape so that, you know, only a particular pollinator can get in there and access the, the nectar and then go and visit another flower that's that same exact shape and just deliver the pollen to that flower. So we see um, a lot of examples of coevolution. These plants and their pollinators are sort of evolving in the same direction. And as a result, we see what are called pollination syndromes or um, characteristic um, characteristic groups of characters in flowers depending on who pollinates them. So for example, we often see that flowers that are bat pollinated have these characteristics. Their colors are sort of drab, sort of dull. A lot of them are white. They have a strong sort of musky odor or a fruity odor that's attractive to mammals like bats, especially um, some if they eat fruits. They're often really large flowers that can handle the, the weight of a bat landing on them. They're often closed during the day and they bloom at night when bats are active and they have abundant nectar. So they're feeding an organism that has really high energy requirements and they produce a lot of, a lot of rewards, a lot of food rewards for bats. On the other hand, 
flowers that are attractive to bees are usually bright white or yellow or blue in color. They have a pleasant odor to them. They're often, they often have a landing platform so that the bee can land, so they need to land, unlike something like a hummingbird that can hover and drink nectar while hovering in the air next to the flower. You've probably seen hummingbirds do that. Bees are active at night. Flowers that are pollinated by bees are open during the day, and there's usually nectar. So there's a big difference between plants that are pollinated by animals, like we see here, and plants that are pollinated by the wind. So as I mentioned, that is a much less precise way. It's not as efficient. They have to produce a ton of pollen. They're not trying to attract animals. So they generally have really reduced petals, sometimes no petals and dull colors. They're not trying, again, they're not trying to attract animals, so they don't bother producing scents, they don't bother producing nectar, and they can bloom any time of the day, and they often have their stigmas exerted, or their anthers exerted. So the stigmas need to be exerted, they need to hang out in order to try to maximize their chances of of pollination, of, of having a pollen grain land on the stigmas. And that's, so th these are much different flowers um, compared to the animal pollinated flowers. So we didn't talk about all of these, but your book um, mentioned the pollination syndrome for flowers that are pollinated by some of these other organisms. So you should be familiar with the pollination syndromes and know that this is an example of co-evolution where two organisms are evolving together. Okay, so in conclusion, you should be familiar with the shared derived characteristics of angiosperms, so their flowers and their fruits. These are really important structures. The flower is extremely useful in aiding in sexual reproduction, and it attracts the, the pollinators that increase the efficiency of that process. The fruits, which we'll talk more about next week, are really important in some cases in helping to disperse the seeds and also protect the seeds. You should be familiar with the parts of the flower, both the sterile and the fertile worlds and their functions. And you should know how this all fits together. How are those reproductive parts that are being generated in the flowers, how do they fit into the angiosperm life cycle? And you should be familiar with the role of pollination in the angiosperm life cycle and also the pollination syndromes. Thank you for listening.